Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ian Table. I'm here to do my talk on how an automotive researcher had his car stolen by a can injection. That's the official title of this talk. The unofficial title of this talk is The Irony of How an Automotive Security Researcher Had His Car Stolen by a Method He Found on Another Vehicle. Yeah, great. Um, my um, uh, colleague um, who did the research with me, Dr. Ken Tindall, isn't present, but he has recorded some of the slides here. So I will be introducing him now, and I'll intro my, introduce myself after. There should be audio. That should be on room. Been uh, working with Ken in the car industry. Am I? Uh, my name is Dr. Ken Tindall, uh, and uh, Ian calls me uh, the Ken Bus Guru. Uh, and it's true. I. Working with Ken in the car industry for our Am I? Uh, my name is Dr. Ken Tindall, uh, and uh, Ian calls me uh, the Ken Bus Guru. Uh, and it's true, I've been in, uh, working with Ken in the car industry for a long time. Uh, an industry veteran, started in 1995 uh, with Volvo's uh, P2X uh, large platform project. Uh, and that was back when Can was a shiny new thing, and this was their first major uh, Can platform. Uh, I helped Motorola design the first real-time uh, CAN controller uh, and I sold my uh, startup back, back then to, to Bosch, so uh, an industry veteran. Uh, I'm the CTO of uh, Canis Labs uh, and that's a, a CAN bus security company uh, and uh, I have quite a few roles there. I've been a hardware uh, IP designer, so I designed um, uh, CAN HG, uh, the protocol for speeding up CAN by inserting extra uh, fast data in, inside a, a slow CAN bit. Uh, and I've been uh, an embedded uh, real-time hardware uh, software designer uh, and I designed uh, the CryptoCAN uh, system for encrypting any CAN frame. Uh, and today I'm uh, working on the uh, CAN Automation uh, CANSEC working group for CANXL security. So uh, now I'll introduce who I am. Uh, you could say I'm the ultimate car hacker. I built this vehicle 18 years ago now. It's based on the Ford Sierra rear-wheel drive platform uh, from around the 1990s. It's got a Ford Focus 2-litre engine in. It does actually have three ECUs and it includes CAN, but if you want to try and hack it, I think you would be sitting on my lap um, because the CAN wires are out that long. So good luck. There's a little disclaimer down the bottom there. Uh, this work was carried out on my own money, on my own time, and nothing to do with any current or previous employers, uh, just to get that clear. So a little bit of a history about my car hacking in the past. Uh, in 2015, I bought this um, Citroen DS5 and you could um, tether your phone to the head unit and surf the internet from the phone, uh, from the car. Uh, why you'd want to, I don't know, whatever. Um, but um, if you did a Nmap scan in the other direction, you could find four ports open, uh, 23, 111, and 20,000. 23 is Telnet, like everyone knows. Guess what? No credentials, straight in route access. You could then extricate any of the data via the USB or via FTP, ser FTP server mapped as a path. Um, yeah, so great. I um, wrote up my findings, sent them over to Citroen in uh, France and said, by the way, is this not a matter of French national security because the French president gets driven around in one of these things? And they were like, meh, I don't care. Uh, one of my most popular tweets or one of my most personal uh, highlighted tweet is um, from uh, Charlie Miller himself um, saying, yep, good find, great. Uh, that was in 2017. Um, August 2018, I spoke at uh, DEF CON Car Hacking Village, uh, DEF CON 26 now, um, about the entire um, findings and what I found, how I found it, the disclosure process and how they fixed it. Guess what? They disabled the Wi-Fi. They didn't actually disable the Telnet daemon. You could still go back in over the Bluetooth and turn it back on by modifying those SQLite databases that just happened to be in there. So great, wonderful. Um, eventually, they did actually disable the um, Telnet daemon in about three versions of software later, but no one actually had ever got a recall to actually say, here's a security update to your head unit. So good luck. If you've got one of them there, it's probably still vulnerable. 
Um, in September 18, I went to the Bug Crowd Bug Bash. Uh, I was one of 12 global researchers at the event in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and um, the vehicles there all had radar guided cruise control. If you look at the around the radar guided cruise control sensor, which is that one there, um, there's a little plastic shroud. Pop that out with a screwdriver, take two bolts out, sensors out, you're at, on the CAN bus wiring. Guess what that CAN bus wiring can do? Start, stop the car, unlock the vehicle, disarm and arm the alarm, open the trunk. Um, we weren't actually allowed to test whether we could actually do any hacks on a moving vehicle, but um, yes, we did get a payout between myself, Spectres and RQU of a five-figure sum. Um, so thank you very much, Bug Crowd. Hell yeah. Uh, after I did that, uh, there's a picture of me, slightly slimmer, slightly younger version, of doing a ha-ha, watch this. tap 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 Unlock. tap 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 Car started. Yeah. I can steal a vehicle, that vehicle, I can't tell you which, because an NDA, in under 90 seconds from a Virgin vehicle. And the car is still vulnerable today, one generation later. So, great. Security really works, doesn't it? Uh, since then, um, using that money from that bounty, I um, built my own car in a box called PD0. Uh, PD0 is a Peugeot 208, P for Peugeot, and D0 is 208 in hex. It's basically most of the electronics from that vehicle, except for the airbag ECU, and it thinks it's a fully working car. The inspiration was 3P over there, but as you can see on the left there, there's a um, ABS simulator for the wheel speed sensors. There's a uh, crank and cam sensor simulator for the speed, uh, for the engine speed, etc. There's some O2 simulators as well. If you want any of the hardware to do that, contact me. I have spares of those things and I have instructions on how to do it. It's up on my GitHub. Um, but I now take this around the UK and Europe as part of the Car Hacking Village Europe. I've actually been requested to take it to Australia, Brazil, uh, America, uh, Singapore, Philippines, amongst other places. But I took it to Amsterdam once and that was fun. What's in the box? A car. What, a model car? No, a whole car. Security man didn't find it funny. It was like, yeah, what do you do that for? And it was like, on your way. I don't want to fill that form in. So, great. Um, in October 2019, I again went to the bug bash in the global headquarters of the same OEM up in Detroit. Again, can't mention it, but it's in Detroit. There's one of a few. Um, and there was Radar Hack version 2. This little device here is based on an ESP32. It has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and it also has an infrared um, receiver. At the bottom there is a um, little remote control. If I put that device between the radar and the radar um, wiring and go the other side of the car park, press the button, the trunk opens. There's nothing you can do about it. Yes, it's a targeted hack against a single vehicle, but you could have some fun with your mate's car. Um, you could also possibly test it on a moving vehicle because the Bluetooth actually is a uh, Bluetooth can, um, but they wouldn't allow us to test it on a moving vehicle because that would be dangerous and we might do something stupid. Um, so yeah, uh, in October 2019 also went to the Auto Isaac um, over in Texas for Hacker One at Toyota's headquarters. Um, that will come pertinent later. Um, myself, Spectres and Muttley did a talk about vulnerability disclosure program and how that's valu valuable to the automotive industry and how researchers like myself and others can help the automotive industry and you need to have this program in place so that we can get you that information and you can start to fix things. Some vendors do have it, some vendors do it well, some vendors don't, but uh, yep. Um, 2020, or the COVID year as you call it, um, I made this little box here. It's what I call value pasta. Um, the, real fa the real version of Toyota pasta is over there somewhere on the PWC stand. Their version costs you $30,000. That's a car. That version cost me $800 to build. It does almost exactly the same thing. And I've actually retrofitted it with RFID based ignition and the um, JBL speaker thing I'm talking about is actually possible to plug it in and basically use this to start the ignition on the car in the case. So 
None of that code is in the code that is on GitHub because I'm not going to release that because I'm not stupid. It's actually stored in the EEPROM and no one's ever going to get that other than me. But it is actually vulnerable. I was going to bring it, but I didn't have enough space in my um, hand luggage. So, yep. Uh, onto the um, actual theft itself. Uh, April last year, um, I came out on a Sunday morning, found my bumper hanging off and the wheel arch um, trim hanging off and the headlight was unplugged and I'm thinking, that's on the um, curbside. No one's hit it. That looks like vandalism. Looks a bit dodgy. I didn't even think it was trying to, try and to steal my car. And then a friend of mine who's another security researcher got in contact and said, by the way, they might be trying to nick it. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. I actually tested the um, radar sensor on the Toyota. It's on a different network. You can't do it by the radar sensor. You can do it by the headlight, though. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Um, so at that point, I um, bought myself a dash cam, installed it front and rear. Um, come back to that in a second. Uh, in July, I started a new job up the other end of the country. I had to leave at sort of five o'clock in the morning, came out, found the same thing again, bumper hanging off, headlight not working. So I drove to work with one headlight in the dark. Not a good idea, whatever. Um, not quite the dark, but yeah. Um, so when I got to work, I then put it all back together, plugged it all in, everything's all hunky-dory. Came back home. Next day, everything was fine with work. Go to bed Wednesday night. Get a, get a nudge from the missus at half past two in the morning. Where did you park the car last night? Same place I usually park it. Uh, oh crap, it's not there. Um, so look out the window. Big space, no car, shit. So what do I do? Get onto the old My Toyota app. Um, you may or may not be able to see this, but the My Toyota app says uh, it's got 100% fuel, um, 11,463 miles, and at the bottom there, if you see just where it's got the um, icons, it says vehicle in motion. So the car was currently in motion. It doesn't track a vehicle that has been stolen. There is no way to track a vehicle that has been stolen because there is the issue of, say there was a domestic violence case and someone wanted to get away from their other half, someone might have access to the app so they know where you are. So the only time that actually updates is when it actually stops at the other end, which is great. But that comes on to my next um, thing from the My Toyota app. I got an update saying the fuel gauge is down at 50%. Where was it when the fuel gauge was down at 50%? I don't know. It must have known somewhere where it was. But, yeah, great. I'm not going to dox myself because I don't actually live there anymore. Um, so, don't worry. So, in the uh, My Toyota app, you get notifications. As you can see, those big orange alerts are like, oh, bugger, something bad has happened. Uh, the one at the top says, hybrid system, major malfunction, take it to a dealer immediately. The one below it says sonar system. Again, take it to the dealer immediately. So they basically screwed the car. Bugger. Uh, so I couldn't track where it was. Uh, it didn't then appear ever again. Uh, phoned the police. They couldn't do anything. Um, tried to contact Toyota online. They wouldn't do anything because they don't have stolen vehicle tracking in the country, which is a bit shit, really. Um, uh, actually, a friend of mine, um, Ken, actually thought it was a targeted hack because I did the radar hack and someone thought, oh, it must be another car hacker. They've nicked the car for a couple of days and it will reappear in three days' time. It didn't. A couple of weeks later, my neighbour has a Land Cruiser. Or shall we say, had a Land Cruiser. First time they tried to nick it, the alarm went off and they run off. Uh, the three little scroats. A um, couple of weeks later, uh, he left it out on the road uh, around the front. We went in for half an hour, came back out, it was gone. So it wasn't a targeted hack. Uh, there was two vehicles from my block stolen. Um, and also there are a couple of RAV4s around the area where I used to live that I used to see around and about that aren't there anymore either. So there are quite a few that were stolen from that area. And looking on Reddit and things, there are also quite a few in the North London area that have also been stolen. Um, so on to my initial investigations. I'm not going to play this video because it's a bit dark and a bit rubbish and you can't really see it. But if you take a look at the video there, QR code, 
Uh, this video is linked in the blog post. When we first linked it, it had 20,000 views on it. It now currently has about 330,000 views on it. I think they've made some money out of us linking to their video. Good luck to them, because they had their, their car nicked as well. So that's great. So on to another vehicle. This one was from Twitter. This is slightly sped up and takes about um, 90 seconds in total. So playing around in the corner by the bumper. Mate comes along with a torch. See the lights come on. Doors are open. Jobs are good. Car's gone. That's literally 90 seconds. Oh, bugger. Um, so I did a bit of an investigation. Uh, I spoke to a friend of mine who works in um, vehicle system forensics. Uh, he used to be an ex-police um, traffic cop. And he said he'd come across some of these things with his colleagues that he used to work with. And they are basically a little Bluetooth speaker um, that has some extra electronics inside it that you plug into the CAN bus in the back of the headlight wiring. The giveaway is the two pins here to a USB-C cable. So yeah, great. Um, but this is used for plausible deniability. They get stopped in the street. It's a speaker. It's broken. It doesn't work. If they were clever, they could actually put a slightly smaller speaker in and still work. But whatever. But they're sold as emergency start devices. Why would a locksmith want something that looks vaguely like a USB speaker to go and um, open cars? Yeah, not good. When I first found out about it, uh, the price of this device was 1,500 euros. When I actually eventually got around to buying it in February this year, the price had gone up to 2,500 euros. Um, I'm not going to give any details of where I purchased it from because they actually don't sell it anymore. Um, but if you Google emergency start device JBL, you'll find it. And there are um, shops across Europe and in Eastern Europe, in America, other places that now sell it for nearly four, 5,000 euros or $5,000. So the price is going up because they're obviously in demand. Um, but yeah. Here's a list of the actually claimed devices it actually believes it works on. So you've got the um, Toyota Supra, Prius, uh, CHR, RAV4, uh, Highlander, Land Cruiser, Pro Ace, and the majority of the Lexus range. So that's quite a widespread. Um, so yeah, um, you can nick quite a few different cars quite easily, very cheap. So what is actually in this device? You've got uh, externally, it just looks like a JBL speaker. Internally, there's the electronics from the speaker, the blue PCB. The black blob is the electronics for the actual device itself. I can't give you the details of the underneath the black blob because that gives away what it actually is. But basically, there's a PIC 18F25K80 and a modified CAN transceiver. I can't go into the details on how that modified CAN transceiver works. Uh, or what it does. Um, Ken's going to go through that in a minute. And oh, so, yes, it is modified. That details will never get out. I tried to do a bit of reverse engineering with my old pick kit thing, but there's no honor amongst thieves. And the bastard had locked down the, bit, um, the firmware so you couldn't read it out. Um, but there is a Heart of Darkness attack that you can do on that chip. Um, but you potentially need two of those chips because you have to read it out half of the chip at a time, which is, I'm not buying another one, especially as it's four and a half thousand euros now. There is possibly a few other ways to glitch it and get access to the um, um, firmware as well, but we believe we've actually got the data out anyway by just what it does on the CAN bus. Uh, I'm now going to hand back to Ken. Well, let's look at some uh, bench uh, testing that we did to investigate how this, uh, this theft device works. First point I want to make out is this is using fake data. Uh, so we've renamed the Canon Advisor and Payloads uh, because we're not here to help people make uh, devices to steal Toyota cars. Um, so this is a logic analyzer trace um, and we've got some uh, uh, CAN data here from uh, various uh, uh, ECU traces and uh, the uh, theft device. And there's a signal here called um, inject uh, uh, chip select. So that uh, enables the um, override transceiver, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then this is the uh, uh, TX line uh, for the injector, uh, the uh, F device that's injecting CAN frames. Um, and then we can see here um, 
all the other ECUs. So here's a transmit line from one of the ECUs and then various uh, can high low signals on the bus. And then we have another uh, receive um, pin uh, on the can transceiver so we can see what, uh, what comes through. Uh, so this is a standard can frame, it's all very nice. So here's the digital line as it goes through. Here's what's transmitted. Uh, here's the can high low lines are pulled apart when we have a dominant bit. Um, and uh, that all comes through just fine here. So this is a perfectly fine cat frame. Now let's have a look when we turn on uh, the inject chip select line. Uh, so this turns on the, um, uh, the transceiver and that forces a uh, recessive state onto the bus. So here we're, uh, we're injecting a, uh, uh, a one bit onto the can line. So we're injecting a, a recessive state. And here's an ECU trying to transmit and it goes through this very, very funny uh, pattern here trying to assert a, a dominant state, and you can see it's trying to pull these uh, can high low lines apart, but it doesn't really succeed. So what the other um, ECUC on there can receive pins is just a recessive, which is the same as the transmitted signal. Uh, if you want to know why this pattern is like it is, this is uh, uh, one of my can quiz questions on my blog post, uh, which will point you out. So you can see here, um, when we're actually trying to uh, transmit a frame. So here is a, a spoof frame being transmitted. Uh, and uh, here are the ECUs uh, receiving that. Uh, now one of the interesting things about CAN is the, uh, the sender transmits a recessive bit for the acknowledgement slot and then all the uh, ECUs respond with a dominant bit. Now normally uh, this, this uh, override transceiver would cause that to fail and there would be an error because uh, you wouldn't get an acknowledgement back. But when all of the um, ECUs are all pulling together, they have enough, uh, they can drive enough uh, uh, voltage onto the bus through their combined transceivers, and that is just enough to push can high low uh, apart enough to then come through as a, uh, a dominant bit, uh, so everyone sees that as a valid can frame. So that's one of the nice properties of the, the way this transceiver works, uh, nice as in it, it works, um, is it allows all the ECUs to pull together. So you have one ECU on the bus, uh, that's not strong enough to drive an acknowledged bit. So I've been talking about that uh, custom CAN transceiver circuit. Uh, it's inside that uh, uh, resin blob. Uh, it's not a proper CAN transceiver, of course, because criminals don't care about CAN standards. Uh, so it's designed uh, to, to break all the protocols, to push weird voltages onto the bus, uh, and that's enough to spoof uh, all the CAN transceiver circuits for all the real ECUs. So it can push any uh, CAN bus traffic onto the bus uh, that other, other uh, transceivers will see uh, as proper CAN frames. And most importantly, it can't be stopped. You can't, uh, other ECUs cannot drive uh, a dominant bit uh, onto the CAN bus unless they're all acting at exactly the same time. Uh, so this means hardware security approaches like NXP Stinger, Transceiver, um, which has a, a, a kind of a blacklist, whitelist uh, for destroying CAN frames and it knows us boots. That won't work because it can't send uh, an error frame onto the bus because it can't drive a dominant state. And uh, the CAN HG protocol I mentioned earlier also uses the same technique. Uh, to destroy uh, frames that it knows are bad in some way. And again, it can't uh, do that if this transceiver circuit is driving a recessive state on the bus. Um, so let's have a look uh, briefly how this uh, works in a bit more detail. Uh, this is a network topology uh, diagram for the uh, Toyota RAV4. It's uh, very, very simplified, um, just uh, for, for clarity. So the actual uh, wiring diagrams are awful more complicated with an awful lot more ECUs in it and many more CAN buses. Uh, but this is the, the rough schematic. So up here we have the uh, left headlights where the thieves um, uh, break into the uh, connector so they can access to CAN high low uh, on this red bus. Uh, also on this bus is the smart key ECU. So this is the ECU that um, enters into a, a nice dialogue with the, uh, with the driver's keys. Uh, it uses um, uh, asymmetric encryption with certificates and things all nice and secure. Uh, and uh, the, the driver's keys can be authenticated. And then once it's been authenticated, it sends a message over CAN bus uh, to the uh, door ECUs to unlock the doors and uh, to this gateway ECU, uh, which is forwarded on uh, to the uh, engine management system on another CAN bus uh, that disables the immobilizer. Uh, and so the thieves uh, basically disable this, uh, this whole bus um, and inject uh, CAN frames that uh, spoof the smart keys CAN frames to say that everything is fine. Uh, so all these ECUs see everything, see the, uh, the, the smart key frames and act on them. So the door module is open, the gateway sees a valid frame and turns it on and the engine management system um, obviously just uh, operates on that. Uh, so that's how the, um, the, the, the CAN injection works. 
Um, there's a blog post uh, I wrote up uh, on this, uh, and it, uh, it's been very well received, and it's in fact used for the uh, uh, CV that's been awarded uh, uh, for this vulnerability. Uh, and it generated uh, an awful lot of comments. Uh, so uh, we thought we'd do a uh, top three frequently asked questions uh, here, uh, except uh, they're not frequently asked questions. They're um, car security mansplanations from people who don't understand. Uh, how cars work. So I thought I would give the top three uh, why your uh, mansplanation of how easy it all is is not actually uh, true. Uh, so uh, coming in number three uh, is just add a firewall to isolate the headlights. Uh, so, but uh, unfortunately a firewall costs money. It's a PCB, power, metal case, connectors, a couple of CAN buses, uh, all kinds of stuff like that and some more connectors on the other side. Even if it cost $10, which it won't, it's more than that, but even if it cost $10, multiply that by 50 million cars, which is what Toyota made in the last few years, that is a total of half a billion dollars. So this is a brilliant security solution, uh, you're about as smart as Elon Musk because you've wasted about the same amount of money he's just wasted on Twitter. Number two, just use TLS and WireGuard to encrypt all the messages. Well, CAN messages are eight bytes long. And CAN messages contain a small sensor and actuator data, like turn the main beam on. It is not the sort of thing that you throw uh, huge overheads of uh, mainstream IT solutions for. It. Car Electronics is a distributed, real-time, embedded, safety critical mechatronic system controlling wheels. It is not a phone on wheels. It's not a uh, computer on wheels. Uh, it's a distributed control system. Uh, and it's all about short worst case latencies, not about bandwidth. So very, even though CAN is relatively slow, because the data is really small, this is, uh, this is a perfect solution for it. A car isn't this data center on wheels, and all these mainstream IT solutions, they're solving a completely different set of problems. Uh, and so those solutions are not appropriate for real-time control. And number one, uh, just use a relay to turn the headlights on. Why do you need a CAN bus in headlights? Well, first of all, it's not called a headlight cluster for nothing. Inside that, uh, that's the main beam, the low beam, the side lights, the indicator lights, the daylight running lights, different lighting modes, washer pump motors, wiper motors, uh, LED projector lights, um, and then there are multiple ECUs that want to control all of this stuff. Um, and, and some cars, of course, even have motors for steering the headlights. Uh, the idea that you can just turn it on and off with a switch is uh, simply not uh, workable. But a superlative suggestion, and one that we'll bear in mind. No, we're not going to do that. Can't just um, chuck it back to a relay. So on to media coverage. Here is a sample of the different reports about what happened after the blog post was released. Uh, most of them come out with, oh, headlight hacking. It's not the effing headlight. It's the effing headlight wire. Yeah, you unplug the headlight. The headlight is now nothing to do with it. But life happens. They make up the stories. Um, it was quite interesting. There was a, a story in Sweden about a shed load of RAV4s and RX450s being found in a container warehouse uh, which were allegedly stolen for payment for drugs to be shipped abroad. Um, so they sort of pinned it together that it was actually done by a CAN injection after the, we published our details on our blog post because they actually thought it was done by a relay attack because both of them look exactly the same. Uh, I will go on, uh, on to another bit in the press. If you know of the AA in the UK, the Automobile Association, the chairman, Sir Edmund King, had his wife's Lexus stolen, and he then published a, po a post saying, um, by the way, put your keys in the microwave, because that's a Faraday cage. Yep, great. He then said his, car was at, his keys were actually in the microwave. So how did they steal it? Probably can injection. Didn't go anywhere near his keys. So I did send him the details, and he is going to have a look at it and get back to me, but he was busy with some smart motorway stuff. Um, so that's an interesting story that the man in charge of AA had his Lexus nicked, and he still doesn't know how it was nicked. He does now, but whatever. On to a bit more media coverage. Uh, Vice.com did this video. Um, try the door handle. Cable's already plugged into the back of the headlight under the wheel arch. Plug the thing in. It's doing some messages. He now tries the door handle again. Oh no, it's still locked. Whoops. Press the play button on the side. That triggers the locks. 
Now he just unplugs the thing because you don't need it anymore. Wander around to the side of the vehicle, open the door, press your foot on the brake, and if you look carefully, the rev counter now shows a thousand, more, uh, a thousand RPM. That again, less than two minutes. There is a Vice video um, with the same story showing the older 3210 Nokia version, which will um, steal 2012 to 2015 type varieties. Um, so there are links on my website to all these stories and things and videos. So if you want to have a look them up later, my website's at the end. There's also been quite a lot of industry coverage. Um, upstream produced their uh, half year 2023 auto cyber trend report. Our research got mentioned and our blog post was linked. Uno can injection. Yep, it's been around for years, just no one speaks about it. They think things are secure, it's not. C2A also published this other one, can injection, a rising threat to the automo auto security. Yep, there again, links are on there to my web uh, on my website to those. So we actually got the CV issued by ASRG and we did that so that um, other manufacturers can be made aware. That website, I bought the device for the Toyota and Lexus, sell devices for very, every make that are, is available at the moment, ranging from a few hundred dollars to $25,000-ish. Um, so no, no, no manufacturer is immune, um, and um, yep, I'll go on to some of that bit later. Um, I did actually log the um, name of the um, CVE as can injection with the emojis. That's the UK spec emojis, because we drive on the correct side of the road. That's the American spec emojis, because you drive on the wrong side of the road, or the right, whichever you want to say. But I'm English, I'm right. The, currently, the CV is only listed against my 2021 RAV4 because that's my car. I'd like to get it updated with the other ones when we confirm which ones actually do work, but that may take time. So on to actual numbers. So in the last six years, the RAV4 has sold five, just over 5 million vehicles. The Prius, about half a million. CHR, about 4 million. Land Cruiser, 100,000. Highlander, two million-ish. Lexus, I couldn't find individual details of all the different models, but over that six year, five, six years, 4.2 million vehicles. So potentially across the globe, there's at least 15 and a half million cars that can be stolen by this $20 worth of electronics. Yeah, great, wonderful. Um, and going back to that number of 56 million, 50 million-ish cars, over the last six years, they sold 56 and a half million cars. Again, times that by $10, that's half a billion dollars. Security ain't that cheap. All these figures were um, taken from either Wikipedia or Google or Toyota's website themselves. So when we actually bought this device, um, I did some testing on a friend of mine's car, uh, uh, Lexus NS300H. I made a device here. As you can see, it's got a little missile switch. That does the unlock. The other switch here turns off and on the um, additional transceiver component. Um, I went over to see my mate and we tried it without the additional transceiver um, because I didn't want to brick his car because I know when my car was stolen, it threw 26 DTCs and probably had to be reset. So I was a bit cautious. Check the one for unlock, that worked. Check the one for start the engine without the additional transceiver. Didn't work. After I left, curiosity got the better of him, and he used my version of this and had a little play himself. No keys in the car, nowhere near. Plugged it into the headlight. Let it do its thing. Popped the thing up. Pressed the button. Car unlocked. Drove it around the car park a couple of times. Yeah. Oops. He then put it all back together, started the car with a key properly, with a key present, etc. And um, the um, rotating headlight on the left-hand side of the vehicle stopped working. So he had to take it back to the dealer and say, ooh, my headlight stopped working. Honest, Gov, I haven't been playing around with it. Luckily, it didn't cost him anything because um, I'd feel a bit guilty that he broke his car for me. So, yep, thank you very much. Uh, yep, cheers. 
I'd like to actually get access to all of the different models that are actually claimed to be used and then have the t um, full Toyota diagnostic tool with the cooperation of Toyota to then reset them and then update the list on the CVE to then actually see which ones are and are not um, possible. Um, the interesting one is though, um, if you know anything about the Toyota Supra, that may or may not be a BMW Z4. So is the BMW Z4 also vulnerable to the same thing? I don't know. I would like to check it. If you have a Z4 in the car park, hit me up later. <laughs> we'll have a go. No, don't, please. I don't want to get done for doing anything, anything stupid. Um, and the Toyota Pro Ace van, uh, if you know anything about that one, that's based on the Peugeot Citroen platform in Europe. So again, there are other, platform, uh, other vehicles also based on that platform that could potentially be vulnerable. Onto the disclosure process. This was fun. In March, earlier this year, I put a tweet out. Does anyone have a contact on, in Toyota, um, either Japan or US or anywhere, um, to help us with the disclosure? I've got this thing that's used to steal cars. I got nothing. So, okay. I rung my local dealer. I nearly bought the car off and said, by the way, do, have you had any issues with cars being stolen? And the receptionist was really helpful and said, no, but I'll get the service manager to ring you back. About half hour later, service manager rang me back and went, uh, actually, yeah, one of my demonstrators, I was out for a night out a couple of weeks back, or a couple of months back, parked it up, went home, came back the next morning, it wasn't there. He did a bit of, he did a bit of a investigation and then found out, yep, they've been nicking it by the headlights. I spoke to him and he said, at one point, uh, uh, late, late in last year, there was um, his garage alone that he worked at was getting three instances a week of vehicles either being stolen or being potentially stolen. There was a memo put out by someone somewhere in Toyota UK or Europe or something saying, by the way, make sure you lock your vehicles up behind the bars and things because they will go walkies off your forecourt. So yes, um, they are aware of it. They've known about it. Great. I then sent some details to him about what we found out. He must, he's then sent them off to somewhere who he, he was dealing with. And then a few days later, I got a direct email from someone from Toyota Japan, copied into quite a few people in Toyota Europe. And it basically said, use Hacker One vulnerability disclosure program. So yeah, that one that I went to Auto Isaac in 2019 to talk about vulnerability disclosure, that was at Toyota's headquarters, great. Their vulnerability disclosure program has a couple of caveats. There's a restriction to modifications to the vehicle. Tell that, the crimin tell that to the criminal or rip the bumper off to actually get to the headlight. So, yep, you can't do that to steal my car. Yeah, no, you're not allowed to do that. So, yeah, great. And there's an implied NDA. And the implied NDA says, when you tell Hacker One something about it, basically, you then can't tell anyone else about it. So you can't warn anyone that you've actually told um, Toyota via Hacker One. Um, so great, wonderful. I did actually get an email back from Toyota Japan saying, by the way, we're going to waive that NDA. But uh, a few weeks later, I got um, someone I know was on the Auto Isaac um, panel, and they were discussing our vulnerability in one of their meetings. And the discussion basically went along the lines of, how can we shut these people up? because it's cheaper to silence them to actually then fix the problem. So someone sends me a random NDA disclaimer thingy that may or may not be on an email that I can't guarantee is genuine. You think I'm gonna trust that? Did anyone see what happened to Carlos Ghosn? Yeah, great, no. Got done for fraud, had to be smuggled out of Japan in a flight box. Um, so currently we're in the process of disclosing via ASRG Automotive Security Research Group, and they are again getting exactly the same response from Toyota, and the response is report it via Hacker One. Uh, this morning, I actually had a meeting with someone from uh, Toyota USA, and basically told them some of the details of my findings, and they basically said it needs to go via Hacker One because we need to track things, which I understand. That's fine. And I said to him, as long as you get me a piece of paper that is a signed proper piece of paper 
on Toyota headed paper, we will do it. We will share some information. There may have to be an NDA in one direction because you might tell me some stuff that you don't want getting out, which is fine. But anything that is currently out isn't dangerous because I'm not going to tell you all the secrets. And I can't tell you all the secrets because it's how to steal a bloody car. So, yep. Um, after that Auto Isaac thing, I did actually put a LinkedIn post with a bit of tongue in cheek thing that basically said, by the way, if you want some information on this stuff, hit us up. We can have a meet, private meeting without too many people around so that we can discuss it um, with other uh, OEMs, etc. So back on to my colleague, uh, Ken, with some potential fixes. Okay, so we've talked uh, a lot about how this uh, theft device works and how it uses a transceiver to bust through all kinds of uh, defenses. And uh, we've talked about all the things that won't work, like uh, relays to headlights and $50 billion of money spent on electronics. Uh, what fixes are there? Um, so we offered uh, two. Um, one of them is to do a quick and dirty short-term fix. Um, so make the gateway uh, paranoid about CAN bus uh, errors uh, at startup. Uh, so when the vehicle is first being started up uh, and this uh, theft device is working, um, it's a very crude device, so it blasts its frames onto the CAN bus and everyone else's uh, frames don't turn up, so there are heartbeat uh, uh, messages missing and stuff like that. So if the gateway device is a bit paranoid um, and sees a, a bunch of uh, errors on the CAN bus, its own frames are being, not being sent and so on, um, it can basically say, I'm not going to forward any messages until that happens, until that's all gone away. Um, and if there was a false positive on that, you would just try your smart key again. Um, so this is a quick and dirty hack. Uh, the theft uh, device vendors, I won't explain how, but they could work around uh, this uh, after a while with a bit more um, work and efforts, or maybe we just move on to someone else's car. Uh, but either way, it's a, it's a short-term fix. Uh, a permanent fix to this is to use cryptographic messaging uh, between uh, the, the smart key, uh, up here, smart key ECU, uh, and uh, the doors, and the smart key, and the uh, engine management, or possibly just the gateway. Um, and you can use uh, solutions like uh, CryptoCan, uh, which I developed uh, at Canis Labs, or you could use uh, SecoC, uh, which is Autosar's uh, secure onboard communication, uh, to secure those, uh, those messages um, uh, against spoofing. Uh, there's no need to encrypt every message, of course, you don't need, you don't need to encrypt everything. Because uh, thieves are not going to get by with uh, some of the really boring sensor messages. Um, it's uh, it's important. It's the smart key uh, uh, traffic to the immobilizer and the doors and other things to to encrypt. Just a couple of slides left. Um, this one's quite funny. I think Toyota might be trolling me. Um, 2024 Toyota Tacoma gets a JBL speaker that has a nifty removable speaker. Looks a bit like this. Is this just in case you lose the keys out on the trail? It's got the hardware in it. A little extra wire, poke it underneath the wheel arch. Jobs are good. Un. I don't think it does, but it'd be bloody hilarious if you could retrofit it. I could do that. I'm not going to, because we don't get the Tacoma in the UK, but it would be funny. Um, this is potentially my last slide with any sort of information. Um, the fallout of our findings, a um, friend of mine, David Rogers found this article about Jaguar Land Rover. Insurance companies in the UK are not insuring them anymore because they are so easy to be stolen or they're basically pricing it out of the market. So the car makers need to get their finger out of their arse and fix it because cars are going to be either uninsurable uh, or no one's going to want them because no one's going to be able to afford a few grand a year to actually insure their car. Um, but the problem is, they will fix it going forward. They won't fix it going back. So all those cars that are previously made are still vulnerable. So yeah, not good. Onto my slide and slide. Just like to say thank yous. Um, first to the ASRG, um, to specifically John Hildreth. He's been helping us with the disclosure process um, to uh, Toyota Japan. We are doing this exactly the same talk at the ASRG SOS um, conference next month in September, so look it up. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to Bug Crowd and uh, all the team of car hackers uh, that were there in the 2018 and 2019 um, events. Wave if you're in the audience. There's some down at the front, there's some at the back, yep. 
Um, Noel Loudon, my colleague, uh, my friend that's a um, incident investigation chap, ex-policeman. He's the one that pointed me in the direction. Zoltan may or may not be the crazy bugger that broke his own car for me. Thank you very much. I didn't ask you to do that, you idiot. Uh, finally, I'd like to say thank you to the Car Hacking Village for allowing me to be here and share this story. I don't have time for questions because cock-ups with audio and I can't give you any more information than has already been given. So don't ask. Yeah, I can't give it. I cannot tell you anything about how it was made, the messages or anything. So thank you very much.